welcome to Kathy's Kotokirk, uh, Kathy's home kitchen. Um, I'm a home cook, I'm not a chef, I am no Paul Lilakas, I am no Susie Holmberg. Um, the difference is that a home cook doesn't have to be consistent. Uh, you know, uh, you put it on the table and you tell your kids, Sayole Restaurantis, Sayomi Slavo Alon, you're not in a restaurant, eat what's on the table. I was an architect by uh, profession when I was working, so I didn't have any contact with culinary uh, skills with work, but I did go to George Brown, took several of the uh, courses, uh, sort of the Saturday amateur level courses, but I did take also a couple of uh, professional level courses. Uh, I'll tell you what I am going to make. I am going to make beet soup, which I don't call borscht because everyone's Ukrainian, Polish, and Russian grandmother is going to complain. I am going to make, that's really the one that involves most cooking, I am going to make two salads. One is uh, uno gurki apple uh, cucumber, two very Estonian um, foods. The second salad is a, um, doesn't have any Estonian ingredients in it, uh, but I'll tell you what it is in Estonian. It's uh, kiker hefne, artishoki, japani punga salad, and we'll get to that later. And the fourth thing I'm, uh, I'm making is sushi Estonian style. So, uh, yeah, let's get started. Okay, so um, let's look at all the ingredients that go into the beet soup. Uh, first of all, beets uh, cut to a sort of a uh, mouth-sized uh, chunks. Uh, this is a robust soup, you know, it's uh, it, it's almost like uh, how it's a stew, but with a, a clear broth, not um, not thickened or cloudy. Uh, and this amount, there's a, there's a pound of uh, beef here, which again I've cut into bite-sized pieces. Now these shrink a bit when you cook them, so they can be a little bit larger. And this pile of beets represents you know, beets come in all kinds of sizes, but that's about five or six of beets of this size. Um, now, when I'm handling beets, I usually wear um, nitrile gloves because they stain your hands and you have to wash them for three days before you get the, uh, the stain out of them. Then we have one uh, waxy boiling potato, again cut into ch chunks to match the beets. And then some carrots cut into coins, with, which is a little bit less than the, uh, the potatoes there. Um, now, uh, two important things. Uh, I fry the, uh, or brown the meat in bacon fat, um, which I'm always saving. You don't dump it down the sink because it clogs up your drains. And any recipe you find where they ask for uh, diced uh, bacon. They don't want the bacon, they want the bacon fat. So keep it. It's, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, and then my secret ingredient is wine vinegar with raspberry juice. Because that raspberry has that sweet profile without adding sugar to it. It's really quite nice. And then, um, well there's beef broth that you, you, you cook this in. Uh, I put in um, thyme. Some people thinks that, think that the thyme clashes with the uh, dill. So, you know, my son, my son, see, the, the taste is a matter of taste. You put in what you like and so on. And then um, for garnishing later on, uh, and let everyone do this for themselves, we have um, dill, uh, chopped dill, chopped chives, and uh, sour cream. Now, you can also use Greek yogurt, and I'm saying that just in case my doctor's watching. Um, uh, uh, Western uh, sour cream, I think, is the best. It's got this little sweet undertaste, which is just wonderful. Okay, uh, so we've got, get a, a Dutch oven or a heavy bottomed uh, pot, and um, add uh, your bacon fat. If you don't have bacon fat, you can use just some kind of cooking oil to do that. Let's see this. Okay, it's starting to sizzle, so...
what I want is to get the um, meat uh, good and brown, uh, getting that Maillard effect happening because uh, then I want to deglaze the pan with um, the, uh, the vinegar, the uh, raspberry vinegar, um, just so it sort of melts into the food nicely. With all that, uh, let's say, two tablespoons of it. Keep blazing. Okay, and now the gloves are for touching the beets because they these are fairly dry, so I didn't get the much on there. But there we are. You know what? I don't. Now let that come up to temperature, and then. Uh, going to taste it. Don't add too much salt. Add salt in layers. You know, a little bit now, a little bit later, because you can always add salt. You can't take it away. The soup has come up to heat, uh, and uh, this is where you taste it. It's got enough acidity. A little bit more salt, um, because the beets are going to absorb some. Uh, Okay, now this has to, um, uh, beets take a long time to cook, so this has to go for, uh, be simmering for about an hour and a half. And uh, by that time, the, the meat will have absorbed all that beautiful um, beet juice and it'll be just lovely. Um, that's nice and pink, that uh, meat will absorb that beet juice. We're going to add the potatoes. And the carrots, and this is going to cook for about half an hour until they are fork tender. And obviously, there we don't have enough cover, so we have to add some more beef broth. Now, took about you know one of these containers. Uh, I'll probably have to add a little bit more at the very end, um, and that, that's. Then it goes for about half an hour to get those those uh, vegetables. Now uh, you can use other vegetables. You can use bastinac, uh, which is um, parsnip. Uh, not too much because you don't want to overpower the flavor of the um, of the beets or cabbage or you know might sell might sell whatever you want. Um, but just just make sure that nothing is overpowering in flavor because you do want this to be a beet soup, not a mixed vegetable or whatever. Now, this is, um, this is pretty well done, this soup. Now, the only thing that you have to do now is taste again and see if you want to add uh, any more salt, and I don't think so. I'm just going to add a little bit more of the wine uh, vinegar. And I think it could do with a little pop up of uh, broth. There. Put some thyme, and that's about a tablespoon. If you like, if you don't like, don't, don't put it in. Um, just get that, let that come up to heat, and then I'm gonna put it in bowls and serve it. Very tasty. I like the vinegar. Yeah. So the vinegar I taste. And the meat. Mm. Very nice.
Kika had an Aki Shoki and Bundy Bunga salad and uh, had it, of course, are peas. And um, Estonian rooster doesn't say cock a doodle doo, he says kikeriki, so kikker had are chickpeas. Um, and then artichoke, that's easy, that's artichokes. And make sure you get the canned artichokes, not the marinated ones, because the marinated ones are too overpowering in uh, flavor. And pandi uh, are hearts of palm. You um, rinse and uh, drain, rinse and drain uh, the chickpeas and make sure they're fairly dry because you don't want the water um, interfering with the uh, with the salad dressing, okay. and then um, about half of it, you use about half of the, um, the hearts of palm and about half of the artichokes uh, to uh, add, and you have to cut these artichokes down to a manageable mouth size. these into coins. Since both the um, parts of palm and the artichokes have uh, an acidic liquid there and I don't mind if, um, if they go in, they're pretty wet because uh, this is a salad that wants to be fairly acidic tasting. Nice mess there. I'll just mix those up. Uh, we're going to dress this uh, uh, three can salad. That's what I call it a three can salad. Gourmet um, Porky Salad. Sometimes I add uh, black uh, pitted olives, canned black pitted olives to it, just for visual interest, They're not, not changing the taste very much. Um, and in which case I guess it's neya purki salad. Today, not. Okay, we're going to dress it with, and as I said, this, is, this wants to be a fairly acidic salad. And the other thing is you want to serve this at room temperature, it, it just the flavors are better there. This is good for just a lunch, you know, and that's perfect for that. It's not really a side salad as such. So, um, I'm putting in four tablespoons of um, lemon juice and then um, two tablespoons of olive oil. Now the better quality of the olive oil, the better the salad with salt. But, uh, these canned items do have salt in them already, so be cherry with that. And, um, and white pepper. And white pepper just because the black dots don't look nice on, on this. And give it a good mix. And then you can just serve that as is, or you can uh, serve it on a bed of, of uh, water. Okay, so uh, this is. Uh, enough salad for about two people. Uh, so you get a Granny Smith apple. If you're in Estonia, you use Antonovka. Okay, and then uh, you cut this into matchsticks. I was one time in Estonia in the fall, and I. Um, uh, deliberately went and tasted all kinds of apples that they had because I wanted to know uh, their apples are different than the, the ones here. I wanted to know when I saw an Estonian recipe that called for a certain uh, apple what, what I could use as a substitute here uh, in, um, in North America. And that's where I discovered what Antonov were. 
And this is where your grandmother's uh, cookery comes to play because you are now uh, measuring volumes. So I'm going to do uh, cucumber slices that are about the same size as the apple. I'm going to de-seed it. And then uh, try to put it into matchsticks to match the um, apple. Uh, and sort of length, diameter, whatever. Um, and volume. So that's about equal equal. And then you sort of set them up uh, so they're uh, so that they're running in parallel lines. It doesn't do anything to the taste, it just makes it look, look better. And to this we are going to add um, a dash of seasoned rice vinegar. Like there's rice vinegar, but then there's seasoned rice vinegar. And this has sugar and uh, salt in it, so it's it can be used for a uh, like a light uh, salad dressing. It's less acidic than most vinegars. This is only about 4%. Most vinegars are, and you just add a splash of that. And this is a salad you serve cold, so I'm gonna put it in the fridge now. thing we do is, we're, because this has to cool down, is make the sushi su. That's sort of the seasoning that you put into the sushi rice. Now, I'm going to recommend that if you've never made sushi, go onto YouTube and find a good video because I uh, there are a lot more competent people out there making sushi than me. Um, but I'll give you an, an idea of what has to uh, happen. Now, uh, the sushi su, there is prepared stuff. Uh, like this one, you know, sushi there. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, again, it's this thing about what is your taste like? Um, and this sushi su is so easy to make, you may as well make it to your taste and to your um, preferences. I like my sushi rice uh, fairly sweet because I eat it with ginger and that is uh, acidic. So let's start with, let's say, Okay, there we go, half a cup of, um, this time this is the rice vinegar, not the seasoned rice vinegar. Uh, you want, you're going to add your own seasonings to it. And the two seasonings are sugar, so uh, there's quite a bit of sugar in here, four tablespoons. I think that's what I call for. And then half a teaspoon of salt, because again, it, it, since you eat sushi with uh, soy, Soy is salty, so you don't want to um, overwhelm it. And okay, just heat that up until uh, the um, sugar and salt have dissolved, and then w this has to cool down to room temperature because we're we're going to next make the rice, uh, and that um, uh, you're partially using this sushi su to cool down the rice. The rice has to cool down very fast. Okay, so. When we get to the rice, you have to get specifically sushi rice. Um, and it's 100% japonica rice, that's what you want. Um, and follow the instructions on the package for, for the rice you're making. Uh, this one calls for a cup of rice uh, and a, one and a half cups of water. But the rice should be um, rinsed until it, it runs clear. So, okay. So just, you know, slosh the rice around in water, see it's turning milky, you want it to run clear. I got this idea, I had a Mexican colleague, and one time when she came back from visiting her family in Mexico, she talked about uh, all the different types of sushi that were made in Mexico that were um, 
adjusted to Mexican taste, and I thought, well, yeah, it doesn't all have to be Japanese, it can be Estonian too. Okay, and now we will put this into a pan. Add, as the instructions said, a cup and a half of water. that to a boil uh, and then when it has come to a boil turn it turn it down to a simmer and uh, let it cook for about 20 minutes that's what the package instructions said um, but don't add salt to it you're you're adding the salt later with your uh, with your sushi soup which is Okay, set the timer for, for a little bit less than 20 minutes. It says 20 minutes on the package, but just want to make sure that now let's say 18 minutes, so we start. Uh, the sugar and the salt have dissolved now, so you take that off heat and you want that to, to cool down, right down to room temperature. Uh, we have cucumber, we have dill, that's the third every Estonian house, uh, has salt, pepper and dill on the table. And uh, we have smoked salmon. Uh, don't get steelhead salmon. Steelhead salmon doesn't have much of a flavor to it. But uh, this is um, sockeye, koho, very fine. You can get these, anything Japanese, uh, you can get at Sanko Trading Company. That's on, anyway, near Niagara Street. Um, and they have the Japanese foods, uh, Japanese uh, cutlery dishes, uh, books. Uh, knives, you name it. Uh, and the other place you can go to is Jaytown, which is up at uh, on Steels near, it's on the north side and uh, east of the 404. Okay, so this, uh, now the dill we've um, already uh, sort of separated just in the fronds, so you don't have the, uh, the thick stems in here. And you're going to be rolling up the sushi this way, so you want, and unfortunately, like it's a little too short. Um, it, uh, I would I'd really like to have the cucumber just that length. Uh, so it's just that you have to, you want a very even thickness of your um, the items that you're putting on the sushi uh, rice. So again, um, got the cucumbers. Okay, the rice is apparently done, so what we do now is we empty it ideally into a flat uh, wooden bowl, uh, but you know if you don't have that then as long as it's wide uh, and open, um, ceramic or glass or whatever. Then, Add a bit of this, uh, about half of this sushi sauce, and um, the, the idea is to get it cooled down really fast. Uh, and so you use this sort of cutting and mixing motion. And I even go outdoors when the weather is cold to uh, to do this to get this rice down to room temperature. Some people um, use a fan. Uh, to uh, try to cool it faster and whatnot. Again, as I said, uh, there are more expert sushi makers out in this world, and they have many of them have YouTube presentations. And what you want to do is get the uh, it so that none of this uh, sushi su is um, well. It's all absorbed. It's not uh, collecting at the bottom of the the bowl. See how it's it's sort of changing texture a little bit. It's it's clumping together nicely. Um, could add a little bit more, but not all of it. And the rest you can just use as a salad dressing, whenever. 
course the uh, uh, sushi rice has to be at room temperature in order for you to handle it to make uh, to make the sushi. Okay, I think it's got enough uh, sushi still in it, so uh, I'll just keep uh, uh, continuing until it's mixing it until it's cool. Okay, now we're ready to assemble the sushi. Um, put down your sushi mat so that the uh, bamboo is parallel to you. On top of that, you put your sheet of nori. Uh, the shiny side goes down and again, you see the, those parallel pieces there. Um, we have our dill, uh, the cucumber and the salmon and the rice and then a bowl of warm water because the rice is sticky sticking to you um, and you pat down the rice um, such that uh, it goes right to the edges but it should be fairly thin like at most uh, two grains thick or so you don't have to measure that but uh, it's a guide um, and you you pat it down to about you know, a little bit over halfway um, Lay it down the middle with a layer of um, salmon. Okay, then a generous helping of dill on there. You see that I've left um, uh, rice exposed on both edges because those are going to come over and meet. Uh, yeah, there, see the pieces of cucumber are the same length as the nori so you're going to get a nice even um, distribution. Okay now it's time to start rolling the thing and um, what you do is you keep your fingers in so you, you're tucking the uh, ingredients into the and then you sort of Press it down the edges just again to try to get that even uh, evenness going on there. Um, and you come to the edge there and then you just wet that because that's going to uh, seal it. And there's a little bit of uh, too much on. And you don't throw this out. This, uh, cut it into strips and uh, you know put it on your rice bowls or on the scrambled eggs or you know that's tasty. Um, again, you know a good pressing just to keep the whole thing together. Uh, and there's your bowl of sushi. You need to cut that sushi in a half and then into. Uh, the ends are not going to look pretty, but you just put them upside down and then no one knows. There we go. So Gabby, um, how did you start cooking? Um, I guess I was not not always interested, I mean, but I do remember at one time my mother had a dinner party and um, I was 10 years old and I made a tomato aspic for it. Um, and of course she had her Estonian guests there and they looked at you know, they like weird food until my mother said, uh, oh, Cappy made this and then, then, oh yeah, yeah, oh good, and they all tasted. I, I was a skeptical kid. I didn't really know whether to believe them or not. But um, yeah, my mother said that uh, my, her daddy Lisi was a muisa cook, uh, a manor house cook, and that I got my skills from her, which is impossible. But uh, that's the story. I try these um, salads also. Look very healthy, huh? Eh? Mm -hmm. So you like healthy cooking? But we try. Mm -hmm. So what are, are these really your like specialties or are they also... Well, I, I made recipe? things, I cooked things today that I had made up the recipe myself that I didn't copy from somewhere or get an inspiration from somewhere. 
Yeah, though probably somebody else has come up with the same ideas too, so. Mm -hmm. um, these are my original desserts, but yeah, I do make them mm -hmm. quite, quite often. Um, and you also um, look at Estonia recipes? Yes, I do. Um, mm -hmm. There's a couple of blogs, Nami Nami, I like. Mm -hmm. um, and um, obviously when I'm cooking Estonian food, I go through several um, websites just to see what the possible combinations are and then choose the best or combine whatever. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, as I was talking about the apples before, I don't always know what the ingredients are because I was one time looking at a sweet of some kind of cake or something and uh, in the recipe there was irised. Well, they weren't irises, the flowers, but I didn't know what irised are. And someone told like me they're coffee. caramel. Yeah, like they're coffee, car caramel, you know, yeah. Candy, yeah. So, okay, that makes sense, but uh, to me, not much. But you know, that's okay because um, um, as with any writing, you're writing to an audience. And if you know your audience, that's who you write to. Mm -hmm. So what are your favorite like Estonian dishes? Um, let me think. Oh, well, uh, I do like herring and sour cream. Mm. Um, and that's a great summer dish. It's uh, nice and I like the contrast between the hot potatoes and the hot uh, eggs and then the cold sour cream and the cold herring, I, I like that. Um, Have I like you found a good herring here? No, no. Um, I just use the regular feature herring which you find at your local metro store. Um, I don't even know where to go to look for a good herring anymore. Maybe probably, maybe at Starsky's, I don't know. Um, mm. But that's a bit far um, to go. Uh, and of course I like birukkat. Um, do you make pies yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of pies? Um, mostly singi, ham, um, mm -hmm. but also sometimes with veal and veal pork combination. Mm -hmm. Not fond of pork and birukkat, not carrot ones. <laughs> um, and cups also, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have. Uh, what I've sometimes done is put into the, the piruka um, things uh, that are completely un-Estonian, like I one time had um, uh, an eggplant and tomato Indian dish, mm -hmm. and I've, I put the, uh, that into piruka, and that was very good. Mm -hmm. So, you, again, it's like the sushi, you um, adjust it to what your culture wants. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of what, what are the like the biggest differences between Estonian cuisine and North American or Canadian? Mm. Well, um, not heavily spiced, no hot spices, um, not not even no um, garlic. I think garlic is used very rarely in uh, Estonian cooking. Um, Onions, yes, but not raw. Um, and of course, it is relatively peasant foody because that's mm. what we were. Mm. We were peasants, so uh, it's robust food. Um, I very much like French cooking because of the absolute delicacy of it. Mm. But for even French cooking here in North America isn't popular anymore because the young people they they want punch you in the face type of flavors, you know, they want Korean food or Thai or, you know, hot and uh, really, um, yeah, so. But nowadays this like fusion kitchen is very popular, like that you mix, like you also mix like Japanese well, I, and yeah, Estonian. Yeah, sort of. yeah. Um, to, a, to a degree it works. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful with the, uh, um, <laughs> the combinations. But I now try the... Uh, Estonian fusion sushi. The one Estonian short food is horseradish. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, so it's the same actually. Yeah. yeah. And most wasabi you get is honestly not wasabi, it's um it's uh 
horseradish with green food coloring in it. Mm. This is wasabi. Mm. Just because it looks pretty. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have another story to do, to talk to you about it. Estonian food. My uh, One of my sons, uh, Mark, was in uh, Canadian hundut cups. And they had an international night. Uh, you were supposed to serve food from your country. So uh, what I served them was herring and sour cream. Uh, but it's managing expectations. Well, I first showed them a map of Estonia and I said, well, what do you think people eat there? They look at all the water, you know, fish, fish, yeah, a lot of fish. Um, and uh, then I said, well, if you like salt and vinegar potato chips, you may like this. And the kids sorted themselves out themselves. Those who liked salt and vinegar potato chips came and ate it and liked it. And the other ones didn't touch it, so there was no nina cream soup. I mean, no, uh, no uh, turning up their nose at things. So, mm -hmm. managing expectations. It's uh, like one time I um, went to have ta uh, the um, Tibetan um, butter tea, and I was told that expect something like miso soup. Don't expect something like tea. And when you know, when you have the expectations, then then. Mm -hmm. uh, then it's tasty, but if you uh, don't know what to expect or you expect the wrong thing... Mm. If you uh, expect something sweet, then, then it's something like, that is yeah. sweet. So oh, one time I made um, this Lithuanian beet summer beet soup, chai or something like that. Um, uh, sorry, Richard, I messed that one up on you. Um, and uh, I had it at work and uh, there's this pink uh, food uh, on my plate and, it, and people thought I was eating dessert. It is, you know, a, uh, the, the fluffy yeah. strawberry mousse or something like that. But 